Right. So today we're discussing the yamas and niyamas. But before we get there, just a, a quick refresh on last week, Samadhi Pada, chapter one. Um, you know, 51 sutras in chapter one, and we covered it in an hour. So I'm hoping to try and cover 35 today. Um, but yeah, yoga chitta, chitta vritti nirodhya. Yoga chitta vritti nirodhya. Basically, yoga is the cessation of the fluctuation of the mind. If you understand that, you don't need the second chapter, right? So basically, that's it. If you understand how to still your mind and not allow fluctuations to take over, then you don't need the rest of it. So the aim of yoga or yoga is samadhi. Yoga is the cessation of the fluctuations. However, if you don't achieve that, then Patanjali has chapter two, which is the sadhana. Pada. Now sadhana translates as practice, right? So what he lists here is if you don't have that, but can understand the beauty of it or, or want it, then this is the steps that you need to follow. And basically, Sadhana Pada, or the chapter two, is 55 sutras as well. The first and second sutras, he just reiterates the goals of yoga. Sutras three to 17 is where he deals with the problems of human existence the kleshas. And so before we go into the yamas and niyamas, we're just quickly going to discuss these kleshas and how, because what they represent is cognitive functions and behaviors that obstruct us from experiencing um, the samadhi or the cessation of the fluctuations of the mind that he spoke about in chapter one. Um, then he goes on, you know, in the next 18 to 27, he explains how the problems can be resolved. And then from 28 to 55, he lays out the first five limbs of yoga. He starts to talk about Astanga yoga, but he lays out in this chapter the first five limbs. And then in chapter three, he does the remaining three limbs. But today we're focusing on the sutras 30 to 45. I'm just gonna quickly go to the kleshas and then we're gonna jump through to, through to sutras 30 to 45 in chapter two, which deals specifically with the yamas and niyamas. Now the kleshas or afflictions of human existence basically Ignorance, ego, attachment, aversion, and clinging. You know, I think, you know, in, in terms of the translation, so you see the word raga, number three. Number three, rag can also mean passion. You know, when we think about it in music, it means passion. And this is where he goes on to show us, you know, the difference between passion that creates attachments and fervor without attachment. So, you know, he just qualifies how you can still do something with devotion and using your will and commitment. But if it becomes passionate in that your ego gets involved, then we, then we fall into the trap of it becoming we cling to it, we become averse to it, or it becomes an attachment. Okay, so we're just gonna talk a little bit about the ignorance. And the way um, Patanjali quantifies ignorance, it's when we allow the other afflictions to control us, whether these afflictions be unconscious, pre-conscious or conscious. So he's saying every time we allow something to control us, even if we know we're allowing it to control us, that's being ignorant. If it, it's you're allowing it to control you and it's not moving in the direction you want it to move, then that's ignorant. But also ignorance can exist in a pre-conscious or unconscious state as well. Um, and we'll, you know, we can talk about this a little bit, but we're uh, more now or as we go on, that will be explained. But also ignorance is when we regard the temporary as permanent, the impure as pure, 
And when we confuse pleasure, you know, distress is pleasure. But the most important thing is ignorance is when we take what is not our real selves to be ourselves. You know, these are the various um, roles we play, etc. When we take that to be the real self, that's when we, 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 we are acting out of ignorance. The second thing is ego and egotism. And what you'll find is in all these discussions, um, especially the Vyasa, um, Basa, you know, the Vyasa discussion of Patanjali uh, Sutras, he goes a lot into ego and egotism. Egotism or ego occurs when we misunderstand the seer to be the power of seeing. Now, this is a very important one. Um, the seer and the power of seeing. What he's saying is we have this ability to observe, to observe, to partake, to be a part of. But as soon as we create a locus from which to observe, we are creating a bias. Does anybody have any questions about this one? Because the ego one normally can you just run that one again, please? Yeah. Just explain it once more. So, you know, we have the ability to observe the world, right? We have the ability to see things. But as soon as we create a locus, you know, a perspective from which to see, be that my personality, my likes or dislikes, who I think I am, the fact that I think I'm female in the UK, as soon as we create that perspective, of ourselves from which to view the world, we create a bias because we don't see other perspectives. But Natasha, that's life, surely. I mean, that's what makes, otherwise we'd all be uniform and yeah. just no, bland. No. So yes, yeah, so this is what he's saying. It's like, we have these biases, we have these, but we have to realize that, you know, yes, we can express ourselves, but as soon as we live by that bias, we're not actually viewing the world as it should be. We're viewing the world from that bias point of view. And this is what gives rise. This is, he's talking about the clashes. This is what gives rise to all the problems because we all see the world only from our point of view. If we had a more universal view of the world, then we'd have fewer wars, etc. So that's just having an open mind and understanding other people's positions. It's about having understanding other person's positions, but more importantly, it's all about always understanding your bias. Okay. Yeah. So, so does it, um, it then summarizes into being objective when you are observing? Yes. The aim here is if you can always be objective when you observe, if you, if you don't allow the ego to come into play, if you're always objective, you'll make better decision from an objective point of view because even the ego egoistic view clouds your vision and makes you you know makes us make decisions that we may think is right now but if we view the situation objectively and we've all had experiences of that so that's what is you know it's about being objective and ensuring that we're always objective and we know what our biases are when we're viewing any situation Is that, does that make sense? That makes sense, but knowing doesn't actually mean anything then. If I, if I know that I'm biased in a set, what do you do at the next bit? It's actually- so, so what it's saying is if you know that you're biased and you can then understand how your bias is influencing your decision, you can then decide if having that bias is positive for you or not. Right. If it's working in your favor or not. So this, I think it also makes more sense when we move on to passions, because very often, you know, we, 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 we cloud it all together. You know, it's about what we like and what we're passionate about and what we feel strongly about. And, and it gets tied in with our ego. Right. And basically what he's saying is attachment or these passions arise from things that we think are pleasurable. So we're always more attached to things that we think are pleasurable. Or sometimes 
if it feels more painful to let go of the thing. So that's why we resist change. But that too, you know, comes from that egoic point of view as to, okay, this is easier than that. This is more pleasurable than that. Yet, if we were able to be objective, we could possibly make better decisions. And when we talk about the yamas and yamas, the do's and don'ts, then we can utilize those more effectively. Okay, and then this is the opposite of the passion, the aversion. And aversion is the consequence that follows any suffering. So when we have negative memories of things, you know, whether it's uh, ne negative associations with food, et cetera, um, that prevents us from eating. You know, some people don't eat healthy things just because they have negative associations with it. You know, it's not really about the taste of the food. So it's about, you know, trying to understand that and overlooking that. Um, or trying to come to terms with, is it helping me or is it not helping me? And this makes a lot of sense when we get to, we get to the uh, niyamas. Okay, and this is the, the big one, you know, he says, because even the clinging for life, even people who are wise, people who have been able to overcome uh, the other pleasures, have this instinctual clinging for things. You know, sometimes, you know, when we, even when we think about things rationally and, and all the others, you know, we're talking about the ego, et cetera. It's very, it was a very rational process, but he says, but the problem arises because sometimes you have the rational ability, but you still instinctively do things. You still instinctively cling to things. And one of the things that in a positive way that we kind of instinctively do is we cling to life. However, that in some cases can take very negative consequences in terms of protecting our way of life, protecting our life if we feel slightly threatened, et cetera, which may not actually be, um, you know, a threat or may, may not actually be in danger. Okay, and when he talks about these clashes, you know, ignorance and ego talk directly to the intellectuals our intellectual concepts he talks about the attachment and aversion and that's emotional i like this i don't like that it, you know it, it's very emotional very strong decisions that just drive us and the clinging to things becomes is, is instinctual and we all we all go through this we all know this about ourselves at various levels um and sometimes we know it and we still allow these things to override our decision-making processes and our sticking to our diets or sticking to our practices, etc. Now, when he go, then he goes on to talk about, this is the sadhana, you know, this is where he explains, but how you could do it. He told, those are the problems, but how you can overcome them. Uh, and the thing is, he says, by turning back to the original source, these afflictions can be overcome. Right by by actually looking at who you really are, by trying to understand who you really are, you know your truth, without the ego, without the persona, without all the, um, you know all the conditioning that we've been through. Who am I really, and is this really what I want? And we've you know we've also had experiences as we get older you know we realize oh I've cling to this I've I've been clinging to that particular thing and you know I don't know if I really want it and I also I don't know if I ever ever really wanted it I just thought I should have it you know we we do that we 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 all have these realizations what we're saying is actually if you understand that if you understand that if you always go back to looking at who you really are then you don't make this these you don't create these problems in the first place. And then he says, however, even when these problems are active, say we didn't realize it, right? They can be overcome by focus, concentration, and meditation. And that's going to be discussed in the Vibhuti Pada. So he says, by turning what the Samadhi, what the eight limbs teaches us is how to turn back to the original source. And what the concentration and focus does is actually, if they're active, and if we have a very strong mindset, we can actually overcome them. Does this make sense? 
So what he's saying is, you know, if it's if 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 you if the issues are the intellectual ones then it's vibhudipada. But if we still under those instinctual, um, emotional holes, then we really need to go through this whole eight limbed process. Does that make sense? <laughs> Sorry, I can't see anybody or hear anybody. So I'm not sure if it's, if it's translating or on these and all of these, all of the what they call cliches, yes. aren't they actually within us, part of our survival instinct, a lot of them, they're driven from our emotions, from our hormones that are there to allow us to, you know, you learn aversion from something that's hurt you. You learn to like something that maybe is good for you or sometimes yeah. not often, but on these all kind of what we need biologically to survive. That's what he's saying, original source. We need to go back to original source. Do we actually need them to survive or are they egoic? We think we need them. Are they, you know, intellectual constructs that we've built? This is what the original source is. Do we really, really need it? Is it is it right. required for our physical system? So our, we've tainted ourselves exactly. with some false um, things that we believe that we need for for a healthy existence yes. through some some whatever fake experiences that we've misunderstood or whatever. Yeah. So what he's saying is, and let me start, some of the things that we've we've tainted ourselves with, you know, could be in a positive way because they're actually good for us. But what he's saying is only you can tell that by looking at the original source to actually look, see, is it good or is it not? And the only way we can do that is by looking at ourselves objectively to look at what's the, the good habits that we've learned and what are the negative. And the other important thing that he, you know, he talks about in this 12, 13 um, and 14 is, is, is the first time that he talks a little bit about karma. He says, you know, and it's these uh, clashes that actually give rise to karma. They're conditioned behavior and karma is all about conditioning. It's all about reenacting the same thing over and over again, you know, sort of doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So he's actually saying, you know, but if you look at it, if you look at where the faults are, if you're objective, you realize where the faults are and you wouldn't repeat the pattern, hence you wouldn't repeat the karma. And, you know, these clashes exist as karma exists and they determine your physical form. That's what he says, you know, you do something long enough and you embody it, you, it changes your biology, you know, alluding to epigenetics here to a certain degree. You know, whatever we do in the long run is going to become embodied, whether it's from a genetic point of view or just from a completely structural, physical, behavioral point of view, you are going to embody it. However, the clashes can be transformed. These afflictions can be transformed. Every single human being can transform them. And, you know, they can become joyous or they can become miserable, depending on whether it's shaped by virtue or iniquity. And this is where he moves on and he talks about the yamas and niyamas. So, you know, he's going to talk and here he goes on talking about the various um, methods that you can use in terms of uh, it's moral and philosophical. But what I'm going to do with this part, the next part, is I'm going to talk about them when we discuss the various, um, uh, like, you know, 15 to 19 pertains to asanas, and then they pertain to uh, pranayam, etc. So now, based on this particular 14, where kleshas can be transformed, giving rise to virtue and iniquity, we're moving on to the yamas and niyamas. Okay, so we're going to, to move, jump right to 31. So, and he, you know, and he qualifies this. He says the yamas and niyamas, and we're going to qualify what yamas and niyamas are, um, are not dependent on birth, place, time, or custom. They're applicable to all people at all times. And I think this is, this is alluding to the whole concept of this is ritha, this is cosmic, this is not 
um, dharmic. It's not based on society or culture or the, the current time. This is these are values that are applicable to all times. Um, and the five yamas that he talks about, ahimsa, satya, astya, brahmacharya, and aprigraha. So we're gonna move directly onto this whole non-harming. And this is where, you know, I think um, we really need to, to start thinking about things and how they impact our lives. Because, you know, we all, we think about ahimsa in terms of, non-harm in terms of non-violence you know we have this concept of gandhi and satyagraha and peaceful protests and and no violence and no killing and no war and and yet um when he talks about this idea of ahimsa he's also talking about not harming ourselves not harming family members not harming people with the smallest of our actions um he also you know he goes on to qualify it um when afflicted by ideas that cause harm, we need to oppose them. Also, it's the ideas that we decide to entertain. You know, by not opposing ideas, uh, certain ideas, we are causing ourselves harm. By, um, we, you know, by um, ignoring some other ideas, you know, by ignoring things, thinking it's not, it, not none of my business, or I don't need to be involved in some of these things, you know, okay, it's, you know, I'd rather protect myself, that as well is causing harm by, by, by also, you know, by also ignoring things, by not acting, we're causing harm. We're also causing harm when we approve an action that's based on greed, anger, or delusion in ourselves or, or another. Um, and also, I, I am is established when we give up all enmity so it means you know even your when you know giving up all enmity means actually giving up hatred towards somebody who may be causing a lot of harm in the world trying to win them over with love to a certain degree and yeah the last one is the important one for him was we need to understand how not responding can sometimes be violent so I'd love your thoughts on, on this area, you know, this whole idea of ahimsa and how it pertains to the current world in terms of the world that we, we're currently living in, COVID, uh, vaccination, whatever, you know, how do you think all of this applies to our lives right now? I think, I think sometimes ahimsa is hard to achieve because people try and push you, different groups of people try and push you into a certain route or certain decisions or wanting to take a position you know you can't if you i don't how best to explain it yeah you know if you say actually i can't comment on that i don't know all the facts well there's well actually you should be taking a position you should be angry at it it could be anything any subject i'm not explaining it very well but yeah, but but you know, sort of saying uh, I don't understand this well enough. Can you explain it to me? Isn't yeah. that the, the the right position to take? I don't. But some, but some. But at the moment, certain groups on certain subject expect you to take a position ir ir irrespective of how you feel. You know, because they see it as right or wrong. Yeah, but you know, I think you know what he's alluding to is that you you need to understand that you can't ignore things, right? Uh, but you also, in terms of, you know, um, getting to, or viewing it objectively, you need to, you need to get as much information. Um, you know, if you need to actually say, hold off and don't get information from the groups and try and look for other sources of that, of information, um, that's what we need to do. Yeah. You know, it's, it's sort of like, we need to get, if it's about information, if it's about feeling pressured into making decisions, then we really need to find a way to, to not be ignorant, to not act out of ignorance, because choosing the wrong group and acting with the wrong group out of ignorance or giving into pressure is actually violent. Yeah. So I think, you know, what he's also, what he's talking about is basically taking responsibility. The whole idea of Ahimsa is about taking responsibility ourselves 
for the information that we expose ourselves to, for the information that we accept, for the people we support. But sometimes inaction can be the least harmful too. Yeah. Or even waiting, even waiting. You don't have to, yeah, you don't have to jump into any route or action until you feel, that, and maybe a lot of things don't really, because you can't, you can't attach yourself to every cause or every situation. You have to put your resources. I don't know what you're seeing with this, but you can't put yourself, you know, you have to understand that you have to choose where you put your efforts and resources, don't you, as well? That make the biggest difference, that you feel make the biggest exactly. difference. Exactly. In that moment, in, in your moment, coming from your, your truth, because every one of us has our truth and our place, our role to play. So what you have to look at is objectively from your truth and discover what is important or what is the most non-violent thing for you to do. No, no, I'm quite clear on mine. I'm just, or would try to be, what I was trying to say at this moment in the current climate in the world, there's a lot going on yeah. where there is little discussion or little debate and people are expected to take certain positions, whether that be politically, be about COVID, could be anything about royalty, whatever. That's, so it's a tough, it's tough for people, I think. No, it is, it is extremely tough. I mean, it's a reason, what's it, uh, what's it, two and a half thousand years on, we're still talking about it. I mean, we're talking about it then. It was obviously a problem then as well. Um, but yeah, it is, it is a problem. But I think, you know, what we need to do in order to live fully, or what he's saying we need to do in order to live fully is actually thinking, you know, because so often we can actually fall into, trap, into a trap either way out of ignorance. But the fact that in every moment, you know, whatever's going on in the world and wherever we feel pressurized, uh, we actually need to, to take time to, to actually think about it as opposed to giving in to the pressure. You know, I, I mean, a lot of problems that we, we, we see arise is, is, is from just giving in to the pressure, herd mentality, that sort of thing. And it's about, no, no, take time to think about it. You don't have to rush into it. But when you act, know that you're acting from an objective place. Any other, you know, and it's not only my take on it that's important. So I'm looking for, for anybody's point of view or anybody who, you know, who has anything else to say about this, because the whole thing with the whole, you know, with, with the sutras and especially the yamas and niyamas is it was written to be discussed. Because he talks go about, ahead. go ahead. You know, when you say go back to the original source, if we all can really peel away all the layers that life has put upon us and we go back to our original source our seed or whatever that is wouldn't we all be the same I mean we our skills and talents wouldn't be I understand that but would our pure pure purest selves and our purest decision making be the same then no because we'll still have human creativity which is a very pure thing we'll still use our you know we wouldn't we would we'd be talent We'd be, no, but we'd be, you know, but where would be, you know, and that's just, but the talents are very um, tied in with the decision making. You know, what I'm trying to say is, yes, we'd all come, you know, you know, the movie, the, what was it, The Invention of Lies, uh, the Ricky Gervais movie, I'm not sure if anybody's watched it, but basically, mm. what would the world be like if lies were never invented? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's just it. So if we go back to the world where we all can just be genuine and real, we can still create, we can still, we'll have individualized talents, but we'll be expressing what's true for us, as opposed to all the lies and manipulation to fit into a, into a normal. This is what we try to do now, is to try to normalize more than what he's asking us to do. He's saying, lose all the limitations and express your truth. That's unique to you. I don't know, maybe, maybe if, we, if we all were, you know, think about it. If we didn't have to worry about what people were going to say and think about us and we could just be like we were when we were little kids, we'd be so much, we'd have diff more different ideas, you know? Wouldn't our ideas be more unique, <laughs> each and every one of us? 
we, we now normalize or, or norm to fit in. Um, okay, so but, but it's, it's very difficult, I think, to remain both detached and then to also oppose something. Why? Yeah. Why? Why does it? Why is that the answer? Because it needs some kind of it, it needs some kind of emotion, doesn't it? Mean or he's being greedy or he's being nasty. Sorry, just just basic stuff. Then you know, funny kind of. Thing. But if we're opposing because our emotions are attached to it, then are we are we opposing objectively or emotionally? So what's an example of objectively opposing without our emotions attached to something? So, you know, when you look at a situation, you know that you don't have anything to win or lose from that situation. You know, it's just, but you want the right outcome. So I don't want, you know, when you, when you, when you look, you know, I don't want, let me, let me find an example. Um, I think I've got one that I, uh, my dilemma at the moment is meat. I like meat, I've eaten it all my life, it keeps me relatively healthy, but reality is I know it causes harm and suffering. We really get emotional by that. So I feel like, so I feel like really, I have this habit and if I went back, I think if any of us saw, would we all be vegetarian? If we all went back to our core and saw the harm it was doing, would we all be vegetarian? That's an emotional thing, emotional attachment to meat, to eating, but it's also emotional attachment to not causing harm as well. It's all emotional. It is an emotional attachment, but what if we went back to a world where, uh, you know, there's some people who thrive on protein, right? Like I'm not, you know, I am vegetarian, but I have absolutely no desire to convince everybody else to be vegetarian. I know it seems strange because from where I come from, you have to eat what's good for your body. And when you understand what's good for your body, and if you eat that, whatever it is, if it's making you stronger, better, calmer, then you can eat it. But if we, you know, if we all went back to eating just what was good for us, as opposed to eating for taste, eating because of all the social connotations regarding food, then we'd make dispassionate decisions about our food, which will be objectively good for every one of us and in the long run, good for the planet. But, but then, but then um, Natasha, like for instance, I, I eat meat too, yeah? Mm -hmm. But say I went to Poonam and said, bad girl Poonam, you're not meant to eat meat. Yeah. yeah, she wouldn't, she, she'd be, I mean, I might say it with a complete sense of detachment and, and I might say, because it's, I feel, I believe it's wrong to eat meat. Therefore, I'm telling Poonam possibly that it's wrong to eat meat. Okay. Would that not immediately kind of get Poonam's hat codes up and, and then she'd kind yeah. of hate me and then, and then kind of we'd be, but if, we'd be. But if you say, okay, let's just put it this way. But if you are coming out of an emotional point of view, I believe that it's wrong to eat meat. So Poonam, you need to stop eating meat because I believe it's wrong. But if you went to Poonam and said, you know, Poonam, uh, Poonam, I'm using you as an example. You are, uh, and I'm, this is, I, I don't, you know, this is, it's not blood typing or anything. So I'm just going to use blood type as a, as a, as a example, right? But this has really nothing, no significance in, 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 in the argument. But Poonam, you're a blood type A, and there's all this huge body of research that shows that people with blood type A need to not eat meat. And I'm not saying, I'm neither am I saying we all have to go down the scientific route, but I'm saying is if you, if it wasn't an emotional thing, I'm vegetarian, so you have to be vegetarian. But if it was an objective thing, then Poonam would either say, well, Swarupa, thank you for that, you know, piece of uh, information, I can consider it, or she may get a bit of emotional. But you, you know, if it's, it's like if you're not sharing it from an emotional, instinctual point of view, but honestly, objectively, because it feels like the right thing to do from an objective point of view, then you can't, you know, that's where this is. It. Then in your case, you're, you're acting from a way that's not violent, because you're actually maybe coming from the point of view of 
taking care of Poonam's health. And I think that sincerity would come true. Yeah, exactly. If you told, Sarupa, if you told me because you cared about me, I feel it would have a different impact from if you were telling me because you felt superior. Or because, because or whatever, happened. or whatever, whatever, in all terms. So, so yeah, so, but I, but then there's the emotion of the moment too, isn't uh, there? Exactly. And I think, you know, this is, this is it, you know, I think also, you know, the whole thing about ahimsa, non-violence to yourself. If you lead a life where you're not doing violence to yourself and other people look on, on you know, look at it as positive and then ask you about what you're doing, then yeah, by all means, share your opinion, but don't enforce the opinion. I think that's, that's the difference. You know, if people see the, and, and this is where it comes in, you do the right thing for yourself. That's where it starts with you be non-violent to yourself and that will spread. And sometimes being non-violent to yourself is actually saying no to some things. This is where the last one comes in, you know, as opposed to just accepting somebody being, you know, causing you to feel threatened, which is a violence against you. Sometimes you have to say no, <laughs> you know, However, in this whole connection, we started talking about asana being non-harming. And actually, where does the line, where do you draw the line on non-harming? Are we only talking about humans or are we talking about non-harming to any living thing? Well, you know, when you, when you think about what he originally, what he told us in terms of Ritha, in terms of universal consciousness, he means that you have to expand your consciousness to take into consideration the entire cosmos. So it depends on what level you want to place it at, but ideally you should be thinking about the entire planet, the entire galaxy. And for, for now as humans, you know, if you think about it, we understand the planet as a whole, we're all global. You know, we, under, we can, we actually can extend this to the entire planet and yet we don't and now you can understand why this was was probably a huge problem in 2500 bc you know when there was no they weren't traveling to different continents etc so we'll just move on and then but if you know we'll and then we'll we'll come back to what we need to do because what we're, what you're going to find is they're all going to be interrelated so this is the simple one right Satya is truth in word and deed, but we are also truthful, uh, sorry, untruthful when we share information that we, are that we are uncertain about. I think this alludes back to what you, you know, what you were just saying, Sima, unless we're certain about something, no matter who's forcing us into it, unless we, we don't have to act in it because that will be untruthful to ourselves. We need to actually say, well, I don't know about this enough. And we also need to have the courage to do that. So, you know, in terms of Patanjali's explanation, truth is about inner certitude. So, you know, you know, what this alludes to is sometimes when you say something, it may seem incorrect to another person because they've not had this experience, but you must always speak your own truth. truth truthfulness has to be your own. It has to be from within. This is where, you know, what he, how he expresses truthfulness and what we think about universal truthfulness differs. And this, you know, there's a very interesting one in the um, commentary, a very interesting point made in the commentary by Vyasa. This is the last one. Also truth is about when every cell in your body agrees with what you are saying, you are truthful. And if every cell in your body agrees with your intention, you will achieve that goal. So the, what Vyasa is alluding to is when you are not fully on board, when every, you know, when your whole being is not committed to a project, then you are being untruthful as well. So, you know, and then the, the third one is, it does the truthfulness one make sense? Satya. I'm not sure if there are many times when you could be sure of your truth then, where you're so sure that every cell in your body is unified and that's that 
because most things are more gray aren't they than that yeah but i, I think don't never say anything yeah what he's alluding to is you have to you have to try and make an effort to get to that point of looking within yourself to understand how deep that truth goes but you know when you know when you're doing something and you know it's the wrong thing to do you know don't you but i agree with Peter. there's no <laughs> when you everything is pointed you know when you're doing the wrong thing <laughs> but not when you're doing the right thing that's no hard. correct doing yeah, the wrong no. is easy to highlight but doing the right is oh, i'm very well, there's probably nothing i'm 100 percent sure on actually i don't know if there's anything yeah, no, so I think what he's, you know, he's alluding to, we have to, we have to make an effort. We have to make an effort to understand how true it is for us. Because if we don't make that effort, then we are being untrue. So I think, you know, there it's, it's the effort that we make. <laughs> That's the most important thing to actually determine if it's the truth for us or not. Um, and not stealing, you know, means or, or the you know the the sutra says non-stealing means never taking what does not belong to you and the vyasa commentary goes on to talk about how it means um how this covers everything i mean i added the copyright laws right but in the vyasa sutras um the vyasa commentary talked about revenues praise or the rewards of another so even taking praise for something that you didn't actually do is stealing um, sometimes that feels odd, right? You know, when you post something on Facebook and people like it and you think, but that's not mine. <laughs> you know, I'm just sharing somebody else's thing. So, you know, it's, it's just these, these odd little things, you know, what do you take praise for and what do you, um, and, 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 you know, and, 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 you know, don't get caught up in that. Don't get caught up in accepting what's not yours. So this is the one that's heavily, you know, sort of misrepresented in, in various, it, it, it gets translated as um, celibacy, uh, chastity, but what it actually means is continence. And the whole idea of brahmacharya was not complete abstinence from everything in life. It was about having control of one's libido, one's desire. So they talk about brahmacharya as well being um, the phase of life when you're a student. And the reason, you know, they talk about is that when you're a student and you need to learn, then you need to have control of all these things that distract you from learning. Hence, it's not just libido, it's any desire that takes you away from what you should be doing. Um, and, you know, later on, in terms of the tantric text, it was this idea that you can transform uh, libido into a higher energy to achieve higher goals. But that came a lot later. It's not in the sutras. So any questions about this one? Or, or any thoughts about the, the continence one? Shall we? Okay, and then the fifth. Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, sorry, quick, quick, quick question. If, if you just don't mind my just going back to truth and non-hurting. Sometimes could they not just be, could telling somebody the truth not actually hurt them? Well, that's, you know, that's going to be something that you have to decide. And this is where, you know, this is where the, the, it's very good because this is exactly what the, the, the sutras are alluding to. We have to try and find out how these fives, these five do's and the five don'ts, how do, how do we use them? Yes, this may be true, but is it violent? And this is where each one interplays with the other and we have to find what works for us. So it's not like a blanket rule. You're always, you know, it's always, 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 always tell the truth, but be certain that you know what the truth is. And then ask yourself, is it going to help that person or harm that person in this situation? And how can I act in a way that makes it less violent for them? Maybe don't tell them about it today, but tell them about it at a time where they can take it.
Does that make sense, Sorupa? Uh, sorry, I was muted there. Yeah, yeah, that 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 does. That does. So so say some. I mean, kind kind of. Yeah, yeah. So you know what we're talking about these things, and the reason we 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 it always gets you know yamas and niyamas get grouped together is because these are sort of morals and virtues, right? And what he's you know what he's trying to say is that we have to find in every moment understanding what you know what these principles are. We have to find the right thing to do in that moment because you know there's no there's no um when it comes to um the fluctuations of the mind right and this is it we're all dealing at this point in in southern apartha we're dealing with the fluctuations of the mind and for as long as there's these fluctuations of the mind there is no absolute truth so bearing in mind all these fluctuations that we're going through we have to find the best solution Natasha, isn't everybody's truth different? So, so I could be coming at something from here, Srupa from this way, Poonam from this way. So, so what you're saying is that just stay on your path, yeah, and try to be good, and they they'll have to deal with whatever I say to them. Not say to them. Well, they have to deal with whatever, with whatever. You know, they don't have to be your friend. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if you're enforcing it but if you're always saying it from an objective point of view um and doing it out of what you know you honestly believe is your best interest but then you know then it becomes up to them they need to understand is it being violent towards me or not is this something i want to listen to or not they have to choose for themselves remember in going back even to the uh the first one you know about testimony how do you uh make your decisions how do you gain your knowledge? Pers you know, perception or direct perception, inference or, or testimony. Do I want to, you know, she's telling her truth and that may be so true for her, but do I want to follow that or believe that? So Natasha, so it's not just about how we are um what what we are thinking or how we are presenting ourselves it's it's all about our perception mm -hmm. um not enforcing it on the other but being objective uh -huh. and uh also receptive and it would also be on the uh individual opposite to you who will their receptivity will obviously be also be dependent on how positive or negative or what uh, you know situation of the mind they are at so I know it's all like entangled and it's difficult to understand and probably put everything together and take it forward you know what you're saying is absolutely correct you know that's the reason he starts with the clashes these problems arise and the solutions are there but the solutions are entangled as well you know, and, and therefore, but, you know, and therefore we need to, we need to understand exactly, you know, if we come from the basis where I'm aware of my ego, you know, I'm aware of the, of the things that, that the habits that I have, mm -hmm. I'm going to try and be objective in this. I'm going to search for the truth. You know, I'm going to share my truth, but also ensure that my truth is not is non-violent it's not harming myself or them because ultimately you know the whole thing is you harm you you harm anything and you're harming yourself yeah and also i think uh to to also be able to understand and accept the fact that your truth is not the only truth or the absolute truth yeah. so because the truth will is going to be different and uh, for for every individual based on their experiences and perception exactly and you know even when we look at ourselves our own truth changes as we change. You know, we've had these things where we think one thing and then, you know, and then that's these aha moments. Aha, that makes sense suddenly. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's exactly that. But in, in that, you know, what he's trying, you know, the, the only thing is in that moment, we need to make sure that, that we're, we're taking all of this into consideration and we're not just acting impulsively. True. Yeah. True. The, truth, the truth is, the truth is multiple. The truth is varied. 
Um, and we have to accept that and respect people for their truth and learn from them, you know, because they may have something to share that we have not yet noticed. So this whole idea about apigraha comes exactly from there, but also when we notice somebody has amazing truths, <laughs> you know, somebody seems enlightened, it's also not coveting what they want, what they have, not ever wanting what anybody else has because it's about you being true to you. And wanting what somebody else has is, is an untruth. It's being untrue to yourself. He also, you know, it, this, he also mentions the whole idea of, of um, not being envious. Uh, he, you know, in the context of, of achievements, um, etc. But the Vyasa commentary and the last line of everything um, that I've had in these slides is the Vyasa commentary. Sorry, was there a question? But also this non-coveting is our own thoughts and ideas. Um, this is me paraphrasing Vyasa. If something, and this is, you know, where they talk about um, you know, Sanatana Dharma and the entire thing is always, you know, inclusive, inclusive. And therefore, you know, this, this concept in um, things will always be added on. In India, you know, there'll be multiple gods, etc. because as soon as something becomes outmoded, you learn to let them go and you create something new, a better way, a better. So, but if we hold on to any outmoded concept, that's coveting as well. Does, it, does this make sense? Okay, so unfortunately, you got, have you got sorry, an example? Sorry, go. you go first. Chris. Have you got an example of an outmoded we could cover it on? I didn't get that one. And who who decide and who decides what's outmoded? You. It's always about okay. you. Okay. So so assuming right. Okay, let's go back to the meat eating thing, right? Assuming you reach this point, Punim, where you're emotionally objectively, mentally, you've reached this point where you think, okay, I want to be vegetarian. I'm ready to be vegetarian. But all your recipe books at home are meat-based. And you like those recipe books, so you don't want to get rid of them. Um, but, you know, keeping them would mean occasionally following the recipe. That's like coveting something. You know, you're coveting, you're holding on to something related to this outmoded past. You've changed your mind now. You've changed. You want to become vegetarian. So don't keep these books that are going to cause disharmony. I mean, what, what, what I've been thinking about listening to this is that although the yamas sound like they're kind of virtues, I mean, a way to understand them is they're really about acting in your own self-interest. And that, you know, that basically these, you need to follow these guidelines to help yourself to cease the fluctuations of your mind that will make you unhappy. Yeah. So, you know, that's how I understand how you know what to do. You have to think, you know, if I, for example, if I keep following this ideal, of, I don't know what it might be, being very rich, being very thin, you know, is that actually making me unhappy? And if so, I need to let that go because that's not good for me. So I, my feeling is that they sound like they're virtues, but it seems to me that they're fundamentally about self-interest. You need to know yourself and know, is this actually helping me or not, you know? Um, if I ignore this harm that I can see is being done in front of my eyes, can I sleep at night? You know, it's about, it won't be good for me to turn my back on that because it will disturb me. It will stop me from, what's it called? Ceasing the fluctuations of my mind. Um, so, uh, and in that way, I think it helps to work out what you need to do to help yourself um, by applying these principles. So in, in so, summary, be at peace with yourself. Yes, so if, if, if yoga is about the ceasing fluctuations of the mind, then these are just five ways in which you are constantly not allowing your mind to be at peace, to be at one. 
um, you know, if you ignore harms that are being done or you cause harms, or if you are not um, being truthful, you know, if you're not having integrity in what you do, or um, if you are, you know, um, coveting things that aren't yours or not, not possible, you won't be happy. Um, you know, it's not a way to live. Um, you know, you can live that way, but it will trouble you. Um, so, I, I mean, that's how I hear, that's what I hear what's being said. I don't know if that's correct. Yeah, no, definitely. That's, I think, you know, that's exactly what he's saying. These, you know, these completely relate, relate to yourself. And, you know, virtue is about your own rules, right? It's not about the law. It's not about following societal rules. Virtue is about living by your own rules and taking all of this into consideration to make sure that exactly what you, you know, you'd said, you know, this, your conscience is clear. You know, when you lay your pillow at, you, when you lay your head on your pillow at night, your conscience is clear and you can sleep peacefully. So yeah, spot on Ruth. The Niyamas then relate to more sort of external things to a certain degree. So, you know, the Socha is, is cleanliness or purity. So those were the internal virtues. Right, and these are more sort of cleanliness of purity in terms of internally as well, but also in terms of your environment. You know, you can't really think of yourself as pure if we're living on a planet that's not very pure. So this is where it starts extending slightly as well. Um, also the idea of um, contentment. You know, if we're living by our own values, um, and if we're following those niyamas, then our lives will feel, if, we, if we're following the yamas, then our lives will feel more content. You know, and tapas means discipline, but it means that committing to yourself, always doing your best. Which means, you know, sometimes it means setting the alarm, getting up, doing the practice, going for that run not eating that meal because that's what discipline is about it's about doing what needs to be done so you can do your best and once more he comes back to uh, to self study and then the fifth thing is and the self study is exactly the same thing you know constantly looking at ourselves introspecting reflecting getting a deeper understanding is this my truth who am i what do i really want how can i you know how can i approve but also doing it in a way that's compassionate so you're not beating yourself up for things that you've done in your past it's about letting those past go this is where the past negative memories need to go because they don't help you but it's about thinking about improving you know it's it's better to focus on how to make better than constantly going on about the past and the whole thing, you know, Ishvara Pranidhan is always, this is where the, you know, the, the concept of God comes in. And yeah, it can, but it means surrendering to your highest potential with humility. And sometimes people add and devotion because of the way the words are, are written. Um, but here it talks about also, you know, surrendering to your highest potential. And sometimes people have had to, you know, over the millennia that followed, we, we had to create an image of something that reflected their highest potential or their ideal. And this is where, you know, in the Buddhist tradition, you get the deity worship that comes in, the Buddhist yoga tradition. That's where the, the deity comes in and then it followed through in some of the tantric traditions. So that's a brief summary of the niyamas. So any any further thoughts? Um, anything that you'd like to add? So the whole thing with yoga is um, there are no hard and fast rules. I think I say this over and over again. He talks about all these things, but he's constantly you know, and even all the yoga texts, you know, even when we go to the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavad Gita is a dialogue. It's also a yoga text, it's a dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna. And you have to, you know, the reader has to decide who's right. 
you know, and some of the things even that Krishna does, who's supposed to be the avatar, the god in this, the god figure in this book, even he does things that are questionable. You think, oh, okay, that's cheating, you know, that's, so it's all about you deciding what's the right thing in that moment. And can you make peace with it? Is that causing your mind to fluctuate more? Or is that giving you that inner peace or stillness? There's no blanket rules, you know, there's absolutely, it's not. And this is where, you know, some of these rules got incorporated into some Hindu philosophies and, and Hindu schools, and it became blanket rules. But Jared's saying there are no blanket rules. Virtue and, you know, these, these ideas, these concepts, these 10 concepts in terms of the Yamas and Yama, they're universal because they have to be applied individually in the right time and at the right place. So I like the flexibility of it. It's <laughs> suit, <laughs> suit yourself. Exactly. It's, it is, it is really, it is suit yourself. Can you make peace with it? Are you happy with it? And then, then, then you see how that translates directly into us in practice, right? Become flexible, but be strong. <laughs> so when you decide, be flexible enough to carve your own little niche. And I think this is where Poonam was talking. Do we all become the same? No, we all don't become the same because we're flexible enough to form our own little niche. But once we find what works, you know, what we believe in, be strong in that. Don't allow yourself to be pushed around. But also, it, it, as soon as you realize that what you found is wrong, be flexible enough to change that as well. That's why it's a non-coveting. Go ahead. It seems to be uh, you try to be the best, absolutely the best version of yourself that you can be. And maybe if you reach that, if you can reach that, you find a certain kind of peace. I, I wouldn't even say... Uh, happiness because maybe happiness is, is different because happiness sometimes comes with achieving what you're aiming for for you know you get what you covet and then you, you feel really happy because you've got it, it might be it might be temporary so it's not actually a tr aiming for happiness it's aiming for a sense of absolute peace yeah. that's what i think um yeah absolutely absolute peace equanimity no fluctuations you know however that's the same thing we're coming coming back to exactly the same thing. So, you know, the beauty, just coming back to, to the limbs and, and the sutras and the beauty of the sutras is because we have these eight limbs, but if you get the essence of each of the eight limbs and then can live by it, then any of the eight limbs can take you to Samadhi as well. So yes, you know, even, even the, only, the only one, because you need to have yoga and us uh, well asan and pranayam and, and a few others together but that's the only one but if your asan can become meditation then even asan can take you to samadhi and at every stage it has to become yours because even it has to become your asan it has to your asan has to become your meditation you, it has to become your pranayam you can learn the process you know, the, 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 wide, the wide ideas that are given uh, and the concepts and you can practice, practice, practice. But when it becomes yours, that's when the real progress is made. Uh, but any questions, anything you want to add on or? Could you go through at least the surrender element of the Niyamas next week or when, whenever it's in? We can it didn't make enough sense to me. Yeah, so, so the, the Ishwara Pranidhan, the surrender to a higher power. So I'm going to briefly go through that, but you talk about that right now, right? If we have a couple of minutes, I, you know, because I think it's a good thought to end on and we'll, we'll pick up on it because Austin is about surrender as well. So um, here what they're saying is once, you know, we were talking about our higher self, our truth, our finding, as Ruth said, finding what works for you in these 
yamas and niyamas, finding that perfect combination, your sweet spot that makes you feel, okay, I got this. And what they're saying is when you find that, you need to surrender to it. You need to accept it. You need to find a way to always be in it. You know, you need to become it. That's the whole idea of we surrender in yoga to become the pose, to feel that complete release. And this is where Ishwar Pranidhana is surrendered to the highest self. And this is where the deity worship, because some people created this image of this deity that re represented that ideal, all the yamas and niyamas coming together. And then they decided, okay, I've created this perfect self. So now I'm going to sit and I'm going to look at this, this deity and I'm going to meditate on it to try and embody it. And that's where you got the, de the deity, that surrendering, that created form that then you meditate on. But you have to surrender to that ideal when you find the ideal. Yeah, does that make sense? But we definitely will be talking about that next week because that's what asana, when asana is. When you find that sweet spot of the perfect stretch with the perfect strength and you surrender into it, relaxation in an asana is when you know the asana. Okay, so I am going to sign off. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you.